So we've done clothes, we've done accessories, we've done most of the tangibles. Now for something less tangible, more ethereal, indeed more effervescent, we're going to talk about scent today. And we've gone to a brand that opened in 1730, it's Floris. As mentioned, Floris opened up in 1730 and the shop you see now is, I mean, a little bit different to what you, I mean, there's things like electricity which now exist, but uh, it didn't look too different to what you see today. In 1851, there was something known as the Great Exhibition, which was this extraordinary thing that uh, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, set up. And the cabinets that were used at the Great Exhibition are the ones you see here. The next bit is the product that you'll actually see on the shelves. Now, Floris is a place where you can come in and commission a bespoke uh, scent. But uh, the first thing you'll see when you walk in are things that you can literally pull off the shelves. And they have plenty of really, really famous scents. So the one that I would say really represents both Florist, but also Britain or London or St. James's and Mayfair, certainly as a scent, is the number 89. The number 89 is a very, very traditional uh, English smelling scent. So you had people like uh, Sir Alec Guinness, Cary Grant, and indeed Ian Fleming, who's the creator of Bond, uh, who were devotees of the particular scent. You also had things like the Special 127, the Winston Churchill War, and the All About, which uh, David Bowie. So you have a great span of people who, uh, well, illustrious Brits who were uh, devotees of Floris. Uh, and indeed, with Floris, as you'll notice on the packaging, there's plenty of things that we call royal warrants. Royal warrants are uh, distinguished uh, awards that are given to brands uh, who uh, regularly provide products to the royal family. Uh, Floris has been doing this back to the reign of George IV uh, when they were hair comb providers to George IV. Uh, it has now since changed and Elizabeth II uh, used to wear the perfume from Floris. Another thing to know about Floris is that it is a family business. In 1870, Mrs. Mary Ann Floris married Mr. Boddenham. Uh, and we are gonna go into the back to meet Ed Boddenham, who's gonna take us through the Floris bespoke process. Okay, so as you can see, we are now in the potions room at Hogwarts. No, sorry, uh, we're in the perfumery uh, of Flores, and I'm here with uh, the family member. You're not so much an eponym because you are you are an uh, you are a Bodenham. Uh, this is Ed Bodenham, uh, who is in charge here at Flores. Uh, Ed uh, is, uh, I mean, you've been here for a very long time, and really, because it's a family business, it's sort of been uh, kind of something from birth. That's right. Yeah. So I've kind of grown up here, working in school holidays. Um, working with my grandfather and my father, um, then sort of full time in the business now for coming up to 30 years. So uh, yeah, a little while sort it's of working in all different areas of the business. Why do people love scent? Uh, I think because it's something that is so emotional. It's something that you sort of, it's instinctive. You connect with a scent uh, without even thinking about it or mm. knowing about it. So, uh, and it's one of the sort of, mysteries and the thing that makes perfumery so wonderful and so magical is is that it's invisible but it can it can create such a strong uh, su such strong emotions within you and mm. uh, can bring such uh, vivid memories back and it's it's such a powerful uh, connection and it, with the the florist aesthetic in terms of you know, it's, it, when people see when they come into the shop or even when if they're lucky enough to come back here you've retained uh, a an old-fashioned look. Why do you think that is an important aspect to a brand? Because obviously, you turn on the television. There's perfume ads that are you know futuristic and you know heavy yeah. metal or whatever. Like it's you know there's all kinds of mm, genres. Quite obscure some of the yes, perfume. very much so. Yes, yeah. quite artistically yeah. led, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, conceptual. Mm. Um, but uh, Floris, uh, I think, is a very 
great, it's a wonderful expression of England uh, or Britain. I think it, there's, there's something about it that uh, taps into our culture. Um, so what do you think that is and why do you think it's an important thing to retain? Uh, I think it's, it's something that we've... Well, English perfumery is, is sort of one of the, the first... Is, it started really with French perfumery. So we've been around since the, since the 1700s really in England and English perfumery and French perfumery were sort of on a par. And then French now is thought of as the home of perfumery. But in those very early days, um, England, English and the French were very much in contact and exchanging ideas, raw materials. So it is, and it's part of our, um, part of our culture really, mm. um, and uh, has it evolved as such as, as we moved into the Victorian times, if people that could afford to, to wear a scent, it was a, it was a sign of status, but it, it's also become something that's become a part of your character. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have their own chosen fragrance that they stick to for their whole um, their whole life, really, because it's it becomes them, and people know them by that that smell. Other people like to uh, have a fragrance. I suppose more so, people like to have a fragrance w- wardrobe where they have a certain fragrance for different times of the year, and yep. different events, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, special occasions, that kind of thing. But it's something that uh, fragrance is timeless uh, to some extent. Although, but it, it's fascinating that you can smell a fragrance that, you know, we have fragrances created in the 1700s, some that were created in the 1950s, and, and you, we know some of the people, well-known uh, wearers of these fragrances. It's quite fascinating to smell some of these fragrances, imagining the time and, and sort of, you can, you can imagine what was happening around them and, and the world around them. So there is something that is very, has that, I suppose, vivid aspect to it. And one, for example, is, is I, I happen to know that, um, and I've always had my eye on the fact that you made uh, the scent for George the Sixth. You can kind of, it, it teleports us scent, I think. It's, it has a really te- teleporting effect. Definitely, and a certain comfort to it as well. So yeah. I think, it's, you know, certainly times, you know, what you, you mentioned, when, when things are, we are going through tur- turbulent times or anything like that, there is the, a certain comfort in having a, a fragrance that, uh, that you have a nice association with brings brings um, uh, something a sort of reliance, a reliability, and a and a comfort to it, which yeah. I think is something that uh, is uh, yeah, another one of the sort of magical elements of perfumery. And I guess another aspect of this is the uh, the process of making a scent, because when you pick up a bottle of uh, you know, insert brand here, scent of <laughs> a modern uh, brand. The 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 ingredient names are quite. Um, I mean, they're definitely kind of GlaxoSmithKline sort of made. You know, it was made in a lab. Yes. Um, they they are not necessarily kind of authentic scents. Uh, you don't do that. You have you have a process that's much more uh, ingredient led, uh, and I guess probably taps into the sort of the ancient heritage of florists where yeah. that was you had to do that you had no choice uh, but you maintain True. the the kind of the the use of um purer ingredients is that right uh definitely we have a high uh, proportion of natural ingredients in our in our fragrances definitely yeah. and in in the early days of perfumery um it was all, all natural ingredients and they were tended to be less um, ingredients uh, available to a perfumer uh, whereas now perfumery uh, and the amount of ingredients that are available to a perfumer are uh, a lot a lot bigger. There is probably about three and a half to four thousand raw materials that are available. Um, we do still use a very high proportion of naturals, um, and modern perfumery is a lot about um, man-made ingredients as well. Yeah. Um, so I have a few few of our naturals and some. My eye is drawn. Here. My eye is drawn to this, this little um, well, bottle here because this is um, this is actually a, from the 1970s. So in this room here, it's a bit of a museum. So we've got a collection of our archives spanning sort of through through the years from the 1700s to the pre- uh, present day, and we also have some of our materials. And this is actually some oak moss, which is from the 1970s which 
actually still smells very good today. So this is the, the pure oil. Um, whereas in, here in our, our perfumery, a lot of these are blended with alcohol um, and many of them are blends. Uh, careful because that is the oil there. So careful it doesn't touch your nose because you'll be smelling it all day. <laughs> <laughs> and this is oak moss, which um, adds a real sort of depth yeah, uh, it's to, to a, a fragrance. And it's a yeah, beautiful ingredient. It has so many different sort of facets that has a sort of greenness to it, almost a slightly leathery, smoky yeah. element to it as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and what do you use it in today? Uh, it's used in um, a lot of the, the men's fragrances because it's um, traditionally, I suppose, thought of as quite a masculine ingredient. Yeah. Although the early days of perfumery, there were there was no categorization between the um, be between you know, male fragrances and, and ladies' fragrances. Um, but this is also used in um, a lot of ladies' fragrances, especially called Sheepras, yeah. uh, Sheepra fragrance that was um, really sort of invented in the, the 1920s when ladies wanted to wear sort of richer, more bold fragrances. And so uh, oak moss was one of the kind of key ingredients to a, a Sheepra. So let's take your latest uh, release as an example of, of the process that Flores goes through to create a scent. Uh, so uh, tell us about your latest scent um, and how you came to uh, bring, you know, bring it to market ultimately. What was the process in house? Um, well, it was, um, it's a fragrance called Golden Amber mm -hmm. and it's one that um, came about, it's, it's been a, well, a few years now. Actually, one of our perfumers, uh, Nicola, he was um, he was in Italy for a while um, during the the pandemic, really, and in, in around the area of Lake Garda, mm -hmm. and so spent a lot of time there, and was really quite inspired by the sunsets in Lake Garda and this sort of golden hour, uh, golden hour, as they call it, when the lighting is just beautiful, yeah. and the heat of the the day is just sort of starting to to fade, and you have this you know, beautiful sort of atmosphere. And this really sort of captured his imagination. And then the more he sort of read up uh, about Lake Garda and some of the well-known visitors that they have been over the, the years, he sort of um, discovered that actually Winston Churchill was, was a regular to Lake Garda. And so one of our fragrances uh, called Special Number 127 that Churchill used to wear, he thought, well, I can use certain ingredients that we have within that fragrance mm -hmm. in the Golden Amber. Very um, good. And also uh, Vivian Lee and uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier were also um, visitors to Lake Garda. So he sort of, that became part of the inspiration behind the fragrance, really. Okay. So we have a, a few of the, the ingredients from the fragrances that they wore that kind of went into to this fragrance that was really kind of to capture the, the essence of that, uh, that beautiful uh, Golden Hour in the... Uh, staring out at the lake. But forgive me, is the process purely finding, you know, uh, taking measurements of each of them and mixing them together? Uh, how, does, how does it work? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's, it's sort of having a... Do you come in here and pick out from the... I mean, I mean what, 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 take, take me through it. Well, yeah, we, in here we have lots of our um, raw materials. Um, we have a, a range of bases and blends, and it's really... Um, sort of in your head sort of working out uh, you have a kind of an idea of a fragrance that you want to create and so it's it's a sort of trial and trial and error um, basis really we, the way that we create fragrances is, is very much in this kind of artisan way of um, way in our traditional glassware here using fluid ounces and fluid drams this um, is amazing this and um, so where do these date back to these date back to the the 1800s actually these glasses uh, yeah these glasses <sighs> they're so all imperial measurements and so um yeah we're always very careful with these a few have been smashed i'm afraid so, over the years but um we so do try and look it, after but that's them quite because something we're not quite sure where we would get uh, any more so um, and then these are our formula books we still uh when we work on a formula or record a formula they're all um, written in our, our more modern books now, but these, these books here um, date back to the 1800s as well. How uh, amazing. And everything's in fluid ounces and fluid drowns. And they were the books that were used to make up all of the fragrances down in, in our sort of sub-basement underneath uh, German Street. 
so you can sort of see how well thumbed they are. And different little amendments have been made by um, generations of the family where perhaps certain ingredients weren't available or yeah. they wanted to make their own sort of twist on a fragrance. Okay. So these are constant source of inspiration, but really when we're working on a fragrance, we'll have an idea of what the overall character of the fragrance is, and then you sort of start to put it together in terms of what will the top notes be of the fragrance. So what will be those initial yeah. notes that will lift off and what will be that kind of journey that the fragrance will take you on yeah. as it develops on your skin through to the, the base notes, which tend to be the very heavy molecules, things like um, sandalwood or vanilla, um, on the, all the sort of woody notes, musk as well. So I'll show you um, just one of the um, top notes actually that's in, um, in golden amber. I'll let you smell it first and see what you think. Gosh, it's very different, isn't it? It's still very green. It's not. It's 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 almost at citrusy, but it's not quite. Mm, it's, yeah, it retains a. It, this um, is used a lot in the world of perfumery to add a, a sort of sparkle to a fragrance. Yeah. So this was kind of used when you can imagine looking out onto. But this the is lake. more grass. Almost than, yes. This, it, this has a real grassy kind of cut grass. It's actually um, cassis, so it's the it? and it's from the the, the buds and the leaves uh, of the black currant. How um, lovely. Uh, yeah, which creates this this lovely sort of green element. To sort it. of countryside and smell. Countryside, yeah, definitely. And sort of a, yeah, sort of kind of a spot. But I totally get that sort of relaxed feel. Mediterranean sort of summery feel. Mm, definitely. Oh. Talking of Mediterranean uh, ingredients, this is um, one that actually features in sort of pretty much 99% of all of our, our fragrances and and in the perfumery world in, in general, really, the this, this is yeah. absolutely, well, there you go, you, you know, <laughs> bergamot. And um, the great. this is, uh, in, in the world of perfumery, it's, it's sort of considered as the most elegant of the citrus yeah. um, oils. And because um, it has the, so many sort of facets to it, it's got this kind of lovely sort of lemon uh, zestiness to it, but also it's got the warmth of some, some woods, a bit of a spicy yeah. element to it, and almost a florally uh, type element. It's lovely. It, it shares some molecules with um, lavender as well. So okay. sometimes you can, you can pick up a sort of lavender note in, in bergamot. That's um, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, which is, I love bergamot. gives it a, a sort of a slightly aromatic, uh, mm. comforting uh, note to it as well. And are these both in golden amber? They, they are actually, yes. So you mentioned these uh, uh, raw materials. Can you, what's the process kind of from start to finish? You know, I know it was during the pandemic, so everything was slowed down, but typically for the creation of a new scent at Floris, what is, how, what is the time scale, you know, of you kind of testing and experimenting and just get it, and tweaking and getting it right? Uh, it's usually, I suppose, Usually about four to six months, I suppose. Um, can be a lot longer. That's probably quite a quick uh, fragrance to, to sort of come up from start to finish in that sort of time period. Yeah. We have had some that have um, gone on longer than a year um, or even a few years because you just get to a point where you're not quite happy with it and so just put it to one side. And yeah. quite often the best way is to, to just leave it uh, then come back to it after sort of two weeks or so and just re, you know, sort of re-engage with it again. And it's quite um, refreshing how amazing yeah, it's it can be. It's a bit like be. writing a, 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 an article often. I find that, you know, you read it over and over and over and over again and you just sort of, you kind of slightly max mm. out of, of having read it. But you, go, you then go away and you just need a bit of time yeah. to come back to it. You see it in a whole new light. Yeah, it's so it, it makes such a big difference, actually. Yeah. So a lot of fragrances... Uh, you know, come about that way where we'll just get to a point where it's sort of, you've tried so many different options and yeah. you just think, no, no, just need to have a bit of a break from it. Um, but yeah, usually sort of, yeah, four to six months, I suppose, sometimes a year. And then... Um, are you the final, uh, not quality control, but sort of, are you, are you the f final gatekeeper to, the, to, to it being bottled? Uh, Yep, myself and, and my family as well. So my sister yep. works alongside me and our father as well um, still works in the business. So we, we will all sort of um, smell a fragrance when we're working on it. But my, so myself and, and our perfumery team, we, we're 
we um, sometimes it'll be a collaborative process where we'll all yeah. have to work on something um, equally, or one of us will just have an idea and, and sort of run with it, and then we are there to sort of support and offer our 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 views, and uh, and uh, then in the end, I think so far we always seem to be. Um, pretty much uh, aligned when it comes to fragrance we'll sort of know when we've got there and and we'll ag agree yeah. on it which is such a nice th thing when that you sort of know when you found it when we're all sitting there and you can just tell from everyone's face and we're smelling it yeah, yeah well, that's kind of the power of scent isn't it it's sort of yeah it feels absolutely. almost objective Definitely. despite the fact that it really isn't it kind of really comes <laughs> from the heart um, know, yes it's true it's a strange thing but, yeah um, no it's great when you when you get there in the end you just think yeah this is and sometimes you'll have to sort of try it's usually a lot of different iterations of, of that same kind of um character yeah or, or the idea and then um quite often you come back to the, the first one again yeah so but in terms of the creation of these particular raw materials i know you understand that you mix them together to create something like golden amber but are you do you have people who kind of collect this by you know ancient techniques such as sort of pressing bergamots endlessly until you know the essential oils come out i mean how does it tell me how it works yeah so that's a whole sort of industry in itself really all the sourcing of the raw materials so there are um uh, uh, bergamot producers all mm. the bergamot in the world comes from uh calabra in in italy and um that is and, and there the the bergamot oil is actually um taken out of the of the skin so oh, it's, it's from the peel from, is it from okay. The peel. okay um and um a lot of the citrus oils are also a byproduct of the uh, the juice industry um bergamot you can apparently you, can't eat it as it is raw, or well, you can, but it's not. Particularly it's not particularly. Present. Yeah, it's, you, not that it's made well. into a jam quite often. That sort of thing. Well, so. yes, okay. Yeah, you could probably make a sort of marmalade out of it or something as well. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah um, absolutely. So, okay, um, and then the, tell me though, the, the you we could go into the shop front and you you'd be able to buy it, but I believe that Floris also creates bespoke scents for clients too. Yes, so from scratch. Right. Um, yeah, we, we can. So this is that's where this um, this room is is used for. Yes, uh, our bespoke uh, service. So customers can come here, spend some time with our, our perfumer, um, and it's uh, you know lo lovely room to be in. Very quiet, away from the hustle and bustle of uh, Piccadilly, um, and it's uh, th this whole building used to be the family home. So. We, we love the fact um, that all of our fragrances, fragrances are still created in in this um, in this building, yeah. and a lot of it goes on in this room as well. Uh, and so, yes, the bespoke service has been been really popular. So a customer can create their own fragrance um, either from just one consultation uh, from our customization service, where we'll, we'll sort of pick a one of our bases that runs through. Uh, all the different fragrance families and then yeah. customize it with the uh, different raw materials um, and that's a sort of one two hour service or we could have a a couple um, or a mother and daughter quite often it's been popular um, uh, that's a three hour consultation or we can start from scratch and have a series of different consultations and then Whatever service we have, then the customer will name their fragrance, whatever they'd like to call it. And then we keep it, um, we, we write down the formula in the books, and then their um, fragrance is there, kept, Locked in. kept privately for whenever they want to. Okay. to yeah. And who is the florist customer? Um, I think we have quite a, sort of a, a big uh, customer range, really, because I think we sort of span from... Um, Obviously, we've been going for coming up for three hundred years now. So yeah. a lot of our customers um, are have grown up with us for their their entire lives. Um, now we're having a, a, a lot of younger customers, sort of in their twenties and thirties, um, who uh, sort of really uh, like the fact that we are this still a family business that's mm. been going for such a long time, and it's. I think a little quite refreshing, really, in, in modern times where a lot of 
companies are sort of brands and part of yeah, portfolios yeah. and that sort of thing. And so we do have a lot of customers, either that they've grown up with us and perhaps their parents and grandparents used to wear florists. And so there's a sort of a, um, a sort of reassurance in, in the fact that we've been around throughout their lives. But other t times we've, we have a, a lot of customers that have heard about us and read about us and, yeah. um, and yes, have, have sort of dis decided to learn a little bit more about our, our heritage and about our fragrances and come and see for themselves and, and try our collection in the shop here. And the shop's a bit of a, a you know, sort of journey through time as well. Like you say, a lot of people so. have said it's a little bit like, um, you know, Harry Potter coming to, especially this room. Because it is an identity, isn't it? I mean, it, and, and it, you, you, that's an inescapable fact because people from all over the world travel to this area because they want to get to know that identity a bit better. Mm. Um, and last time we were in here, we were with the wonderful uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess, I guess, uh, Ambassador Supreme to the United Kingdom, Kirby Allison, mm. um, who, you know, the part of his reason for kind of coming to places like this is because uh, he has a fascination with it. Now, the, for us, we have pride in it because we're, we're, it's sort of part of our own story. Yeah. But that capacity for people around the world to allow a space in their imagination to you know to let these brands in okay. uh, like yours and then come and see it for themselves is very very special definitely no it is it's um yeah it's it's a really special part of of london it's great that it's kept that sort of uh character and and almost that's sort of um I suppose a slight eccentricity, but also uh, you know just a dedication to to craft. Um, yeah. And um, and but sort of I suppose a slightly kind of understated um, uh, dedication as well. It's it's all about yes, all about the craft rather than any anything. Very else. much so, and not sort of authenticity in that sense, oh, which yeah. is I think what draws people in. And you have the finished product. So once you've taken these raw materials obviously those aren't the only two but it's part of the, they're big they play a big part of the process it's a six month process potentially to get this all done yes. uh, from sort of beginning story to end uh but then you end up having a product so That's let's right. have a look at it yes yeah, so this is the the final version of golden amber um and um which we have in, in the, the shop we just had the launch of it actually a couple of weeks ago um, but you might be Gosh, able to pick out lovely. the bergamot that's in there and the cassis. You can get the cassis the sort of for the, sure, yeah. The top of the fragrance, but the, the main character of the fragrance is this warm amber note. Um, but really sort of to capture that, uh, that golden amber and this sort of last of the sunlight um, of, the, of the day and the warmth of the day. And um, so we sort of trying to capture that at the moment at this time of year as well. That's to lovely. Hang on to the summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're struggling to do that properly in Britain, I have to say. True. Well, yes. Had had a bit of rain recently, but fortunately... Um, Never mind. It's supposed to be sunny this weekend, I think, which would be good. Fingers crossed. Now, this is stunning. I mean, it's beautiful. And congratulations. And I, th I think that, you know, just to sort of round things off, you know, we, you know, we're looking at a brand that saw in the reign of Queen Victoria, saw in the, um, uh, you know, things like the Great Exhibition, which indeed, uh, as I was saying earlier, the, the cabinets of the shop were, you know, taken from the Great Exhibition. Yeah, and so, you know, this is a very much a kind of uh, a living part of British history and culture. And um, the way that I think Floris uh, has uh, remained a big part of it is so interesting because you know, the shop has never moved, whereas a lot of other places have had to move around and sure. take up new residences in, in places. And so Floris has been a sort of a stalwart. It's been, you know, it's, it's stayed in place and, you know, in yeah. a way that I guess is a good expression of what someone like me wants out of British Heritage brands, which is stay in place, <laughs> you know? Oh, and and um, so thank you very much for sort of stewarding that and oh, for taking thank us you. through the processes and to show us that, you know, there is, a, there is a more authentic way when it comes to scent. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be a custodian of my, my family's business and to, 
to add to the fragrances that my forefathers have uh, for many years and to uh, look after it for the next generation and for our, of our customers and I'm the sure family. Terrific. Lovely to meet you. And well, you. See you again. Well, I guess see you again. Floris, cut. I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. That's quite all right. It's fine. He, this is irrelevant to the video. We don't need to go into this shit about him because he was fascinating, but he was useless.